Adding dimension to flat logo motifs can add a nice, engaging dynamic to a design. Let me show you how to handle this using both digital and analog methods. So as with all of my designs, it starts in analog. I work out my logo motif, my design, in a drawn form. I create what I call a refined sketch, as shown here. Now, this particular client is part of the skateboard industry, and their product that they asked me to brand was called Dragon Bearings. They're skateboard bearings. And so this was the brand mark that I came up with, playing off of the name Dragon. But I also have a subtle reference to the letter D in this mark, if you look at it long enough. It's a little more apparent when you see the final version. But it all started in analog, all started in drawing. This is going to serve me as a nice roadmap for building my vectors. So just to reiterate some basic principles about vector building that we've covered in another movie, I take my refined sketch, place it into Illustrator, and I set the opacity to about 20% and then I lock the layer. And on the layer above it, I start building my vectors. Now, when I vector build, this shows the rough build of my initial laying down of anchor points. If I select this path, you can see I'm not worrying about the curves. I'm just putting the anchor points where they should go. Now, on this particular design, I have a lot of areas where the shapes come to a point so it's easy to discern where to place anchor points because wherever your drawing comes to a point, gets a point. Those are easy. Once I have my rough path built and laid down like this, this is when I'll go to either the anchor point tool in Illustrator, grab a path, and I'll start adjusting it. If we zoom in, you can see me doing this with the front part of the dragon's nose. I'll go in here, and I can start finessing those paths. As I stated in a previous movie, I personally don't use that tool a lot. I use the PathScribe tool, which is a vector scribe plugin by Astute Graphics, and that's here. And it works pretty much the same way. I just have a lot more flexibility in terms of the features it offers. So that's why I use it. But either process is going to get the same results. One just might be a little faster than the other. But this is how it fundamentally starts in analog, moves to digital. I start rendering my vector paths until I have all of my base vector paths built. And if I turn these off, you can see it aligns pretty closely to my underlying drawing. Now, that's not to say I'm not going to make art directive decisions on my own design as I progress forward, because if I discover something that looks better or works better, I'm definitely going to work that in. And you're going to see me do that in just a little bit. Now, once I get to this point, I can take my base vectors, such as shown here, and I can colorize them. You can see I've created a tonal family of a base color and a shadow color. The base color is what this is going to become. So if I take my eyedropper and sample this base color and color the mark, this is the base color that it's going to be. It's going to be this nice red hue. Now I have a darker hue of red, and this is going to serve as shading. And it's at this point that I go back to analog. And this is how this process works. It starts in analog to create the design, to work out the design. Then I build it. I get it to this point. And then I turn it into black and white art with an outline, print it out, and I literally draw on it with a pencil outside the computer to work out all my shading to figure out how is my shading going to be formed on this. And this is the scan that I scan it back in, once again, place it back into Illustrator. And then if I go to, let's see, we go to the blend modes and I'm going to select multiply, I place it over the top of my underlying drawing. And this is now going to serve me to, once again, build the shading vectors. Now, I'm going to turn this down to about 30%. That might be a little much, so let's try 60. Something like that, just so it's enough that we can see it. And I zoom in when I build on stuff like this anyway. And we're going to go ahead and lock this layer, lock the shading layer. And on a layer above it, I just start building and we'll want to go back in and just change this color really quickly to a lighter hue just so we can see what we're doing like that. Then I'll lock the layer. 
and that way we can see the shading, we can see what we're building, and you can see that I'm just following, once again, my drawing is serving as a roadmap to build my vector art, to build the detailing of shading on this design. So it's not a complicated process, it's just a dedicated process. You have to stick with it, and the results are gonna be fabulous, as you're gonna see here shortly. So what I end up with, by using this kind of process is I end up with a really nice modeled logo that isn't flat anymore. It has a nice dynamic of some shading to it. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that initially on my drawing, if I turn this off, you can see how I drew the shading on the mouth area like this, but in the final, it ended up being like this because it looks better and it works better. And that was actually a friend of mine who I had shared my design with. And I said, hey, can you give me some feedback? I've stared at this too long. He came back and he said, I love it, but do this on the bottom part uh, on his nose. And I'm like, oh, that's it. That looks a lot better. So it's really good to get feedback if that can help you in your process because it's easy to look at something too long and you get comfortable with it and you don't get as critical as you need to be to make a good decision. So if you have friends you can trust who are good designers themselves, and by all means, take advantage of that. This was the final two iterations that I developed for this client, both vertical and horizontal, and this is going to be used on packaging moving forward. Now, I've used this approach for a lot of different projects, and I just want to show you a couple more examples of how I've used this. Here's a branding project for a small town called Jenna, and it's in Louisiana. And the town was founded by a Spaniard, so one of the explorations I took for the pitch that we did for him is I created this based off of that idea of the founder of the town. And so this is my flat base colors. It's this nice dark brown with a muted blue. But when I add the dynamic of shading to it, and I did it in the exact same process I did it with the dragon bearings, it really kind of brings life to this overall logo mark. So I really like how this one turned out, and in its final context with the text, it looks really nice as well. One last one I want to show you, and this is more of a school mascot for a college up in Canada that I worked on, and I gave them actually two poses. I originally proposed it like that. They wanted the head facing the opposite way, so I just gave them two options. You know, he's looking back, looking forward. What'd you say? Looking back, looking forward. Anyway, this was a great design to work on, but the approach that I took on shading and detailing this identity piece for them really came to life when I added the shading in it. It took it from a flat-based image and added a lot of dynamic character to it. And one of the final usages came out really great is we isolated the head of the character and that became the graphic used on their football team's helmet. So it was a fun project to work on. I've been using this process for over 20 years now and it still produces great results. Just because you create digital artwork doesn't mean analog can't be used to help you discern and create better logo designs.